Um, yes, thank you. So as usual, this call is recorded and then um, we have the code of conduct for the session. Please, if you refer to the Etherpad on currently line 59, we have a code of conduct of four orders. If you experience or witness any unacceptable behaviors or you have any concerns, please report either by contacting the organizers. We have Berenice, Malvika, Yo, Paz, Amy at team um, at OLS at Open Life Science. I think that's probably now we are OLS.org. And if you have an issue to report with any of the organizers, please you can email the in, um, individuals, either uh, Malvika, Berenice, Yo, Amy, or um, Paz. Um, as I mentioned before, the session will be recorded. And then please um, indicate with your name um, whether you want to be in a writing breakout room, which we are not going to have today, or a speaking breakout room. But then it will help us guide to know those that want to speak during questions and those that prefer to write their questions. Um, today, we are going to have a panel discussion. And our panelists are Jama. Nima and Yo. Um, each of the presenters will have 15 minutes. Um, um, Paz mentioned that Gemma needs to leave, I think, earlier. Yeah. So probably after this, uh, the presentation, we'll take a few questions and then we can let her go. And then probably we continue. And then at the end of the other two presentations, we can have a panel discussion with questions and and I think that's it. Yeah, so to start us off, uh, there is a presentation on open leadership, which is our presentation for today. I will be sharing my screen. Extremely bad at this. I hope it's covering the whole screen. Yeah, thank you. So today um, it's a skills up um, session, not the part of the uh, normal by monthly or by weekly uh, uh, cohort call. And we are going to have a skills up session in open leadership in practice. If you look at this slide, we are currently in week nine. This means that we have passed the 50 mark, 50% 50 mark of the cohort we have more than eight weeks we are more than eight weeks into the call which is wonderful uh thank you everyone for staying for sticking up till now uh today our aim is to show examples of leadership from different open leaders and the learning objective at the end of the session we'll be able to recall non-traditional academic career paths and appreciate different leaderships we're going to have three uh three calls and then um, three presentations. And then if you want to look at previous um, cohort calls, sessions, you can please uh, visit the OpenSeed video library. And that's it for my presentation. And I will hand over to the first person, which I believe is Jama. Thank you, Tijuan. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks. As you have said, I have a meeting on the top of the hour, um, but I can stay here a whole hour, so I hope uh, we have time to talk. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Gemma. I do have a short presentation to start with, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, so do you see my presentation in, like, Full screen format. Yes. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, just before I start, uh, because I realized I did not put that here, um, I am um, I was an OLS mentee, I think, in uh, cohort number five. So, last year, twenty twenty two. Um, and I am currently a mentor of this cohort with a wonderful group from Metadocencia. So in this presentation, it's very um, light. It just um, so bad as me this past week if I could uh, join in this conversation. So just to share um, 
my academic, non-academic trajectory to where I am now, which is leading a small nonprofit initiative that does research, but also um, the science uh, research, but also a bunch of, of other things, as you will see. So just uh, to start with uh, my academic career, I had a pretty standard uh, beginning in my academic career for um, what you would uh, consider a Global North um, student and academic. So I did a bachelor's in biomedical sciences at the University of Barcelona in Spain, which is uh, where I'm from, uh, which also included an Erasmus experience um, in the Netherlands, which I'm highlighting because that was the beginning of my first uh, of many, though at that time I didn't know international experiences. And it was fantastic to start to be open to different ways of working and different cultures. And so on in my career, I feel very lucky for that. I continued then with a master's in biomedicine again, so very original. And already focusing more in oncology, um, also the University of Barcelona, Spain. Um, and at that time, I had to take the big decision that any student has to do whether to continue an academic career or not. I applied for a few grants. I was about, I should have put that here. Um, I was about to move to the Netherlands um, with a very good fellowship um, granted by, by a foundation here in Spain. I. Uh, actually accepted the fellowship. I visited this laboratory where I was going to do my PhD for four years in the Netherlands. And I had a uh, not good feeling at all. I really didn't like how this lab was working, the people, um, how they were organized, the community, and, and so on. So this was the first um, big decision I took in my career, which is I rejected the grant which at the time was a big deal because it meant not being able to apply for grants from this foundation anymore for my studies. Um, so I rejected this grant and came back to Spain without really knowing whether should I pursue a PhD or not. Um, and I gave it one last try in a laboratory I liked for the science. So I didn't know much about the institution and I didn't know much about how this particular academic group worked. But I did like the science they were producing, so I did apply for them. And I was very lucky uh, because they accepted me. They paid for my salary as a PhD student until I could find a support. So in Spain, PhD students get paid uh, salaries. It's not a stipend. It's a real salary that counts towards your social benefits and so on. And so I got that. After that, I got a... Uh, a grant to continue studying in this laboratory. I had a nice experience um, working on oncology um, and stem cells, top techniques, CRISPR, maybe some of you, if you're biologists, you've heard about that. Got a few publications and a few follow-up publications. Um, so everything was going according to plan, let's say, for an academic career. So the next step, logical step, would have been uh, to continue on to a postdoc, probably abroad. Um, with either staying abroad or maybe eventually coming back to Spain um, with a bit more experience, a better track record. But so at that time, I decided to take the post that I didn't take in back in 2014 and really think about um, what I had been living in these years in the laboratory um, and what I wanted to do as my next steps. So this is me, real lab person. I love the lab. I enjoy so much doing experiments. I had tons of fun. Um, I was very lucky, as I said, I didn't know much about the institute I was going to work in, but it turned out to have a great PhD community. I was allowed to do side activities. For example, I was one of the organizers of the first European PhD conference, which is a project called Enable by the European Union. So the institute was one of the four participating organizations in Europe. So I got to be the organizer of that. An amazing experience, again, working with PhD students from four other European countries. I also did other side activities like um, outreach activities, such as the Pint of Science that maybe some of you have heard of. Um, it happens in many countries where you go and talk about science in like a pub setting so that people from the general public come and 
hear you about your project and you know engage in nice discussions. I also was very motivated to do training, open days and the like. So we had uh, school students and so on. So uh, all these aspects were amazing. Um, what do you expect of a PhD? I was really having a lot of fun, but there were other things I was not enjoying. The first one is I really quickly realized there is no path to leadership in academics. There is no training, there is no career support. You are supposed to just by doing science eventually become a good group leader, which we may know it's not always um, the truth. So I was feeling a lot of luck into how do I develop my career? How am I gonna grow um, now to, um, to work with a group of people? Do I eventually want to become a PI? So I was feeling like this was very neglected in traditional academia. Uh, it was a very competitive environment, uh, meaning that uh, you are supposed to be publishing, you're supposed to be getting the best papers so that the next grant you get is bigger, better, and so on and so forth, until hopefully one day you establish as a principal investigator and then continue on to trying to get better and better publications so that you can get more and more grants. Um, for example, something that I noticed that I found it funny, but it's a sign of how is this becoming more and more organized in academia. When I started my PhD, I was working in the colorectal cancer laboratory. By the end of my PhD, this sign had been replaced by the Institute by Badly Lab. So they changed, or at Nat Lab or Alloy Lab, they changed the names of the laboratories and they put the name of the principal investigator. So it becomes their laboratory. Um, so right, all these orienting, this academic path towards this is what you must become. This is where you want to end up having a laboratory with your name on it and all these people uh, working for you. And this is a model that I really wasn't feeling uh, uh, attracted to. And of course, it was very results driven. And by results, I mean publications. What cared at the end of the day is what publications you had. So. I was a very motivated student. I loved science, but there were all these things more around the community and around uh, how academic careers are organized that I really did not enjoy that much. So that this made me think and reflect. And I started a search for a community that I felt more uh, represented with. And at that point, I turned to my other secondary career, um, which is as a circus artist. Um, since 2010, 2011, I had been training intensively as a, as a, an acrobat, as a circus artist. Um, and since 2016, combining with my PhD student, uh, my PhD studies, I was already performing and teaching. And I was also in contact with something that we call social circus. This picture is there to prove this is true. <laughs> this is, um, uh, the social circus training. That's me here in yellow, um, quite younger than I look uh, today. Um, this is uh, me performing with, with my dual partner here on my back. Uh, so Social Circus is uh, focused on using circus as a tool to engage with groups at risk of social exclusion, with youth, teenagers especially, because circus is an activity that is um, very easy to uh, motivate, especially youngsters. Uh, it's active, they do sports, it's, it promotes good habits, but especially and very importantly, it does promote a lot of teamwork because you don't need to work as a team, you don't need to trust your partners to do the tricks. Um, so very quickly, it allow, allows people to build trust, to build confidence, uh, to build uh, team working skills and so on. So it's a great tool um, that you can apply in a lot, a lot of situations. I was really enjoying that training. I was really enjoying everything I was learning, so I decided to give it a try. So to continue on my uh, career as a circus educator or performer rather than as a scientist. Um, so I did that. I moved uh, to Zambia, uh, to a school called Circus Zambia. I was working there as um, project manager and trainer for, I think, seven months. Um, and right after that, I moved directly um, into the Palestinian Circus School in a BZ, a small town near Ramallah. And this is just for some fun. We're here to talk and have fun to prove that I was actually doing these things. Let's see if this video loads. Okay, maybe there is not enough internet. Um, but as, uh, let's see if this loads. But otherwise, as you can see, um, 
the year was, I mean, was not perfect because it was 2020. So that was before the pandemic hit. But of course, uh, after March 2020, um, with the ongoing COVID pandemic, I did have to kind of stop these activities. So that's me and my kids in Circo Zambia. Just a short video of um, performances that we were putting together. <laughs> um, so after that, I was again, okay, what can I do now? Uh, how can I use these skills that I'm learning and maybe mix it with, again, with science? Because while well, this is great and I was having a great time and I really found a lot of community values and leadership practices that I really like. So there was a great community. I learned a lot of people skills because you need to work with a lot of people. I learned to work much better with different cultures, understanding and trying um, uh, to, to value each individual's contributions. And it was very much impact-driven work, right? So forgetting all about publications, uh, papers, and so on, and really focusing on how many people um, are we supporting, how many programs can we offer to those kids, what do they need, how can we do better for them? Uh, but of course, nothing is perfect. There is also things that are not that nice. There is a lot of instability. Um, and personally, I was missing a lot uh, my work in, in science and tech because I had been training for so many years also on that that I didn't want to miss that. So this is um, at this point, 2020, um, this is where we started talking with uh, Eduardo and Miquel, which are the two co-founders of Ercilia. I'm not gonna talk a lot about our technical side at Ercilia, but more of what we envision for our small organization. So we co-founded Ercilia, which is a nonprofit, um, together with Miquel and Eduardo, who are two scientists, also um, PhD scientists, academics, working mostly in non-communicable diseases. And what we wanted with Ercilia, the name itself tells it well, I just put this extract here. This is from the Invisible Cities from Italo Calvini. Italo Calvino, so Ercilia is one of the cities of this book. And it's an imagined city in where its inhabitants uh, throw strings from each of the houses whenever they establish a new relation, right? Be it friendship, we are family, trade, etc. And so when there are too many strings that you cannot cross the city, they build the city, leaving the network they have created. They move somewhere else and start building anew. So this is the kind of science we wanted to see. This is the kind of community-focused uh, projects we wanted to work on. Uh, this is an image made with my journey um, on the city of Brasilia, of the imagined city of Brasilia. So this is what was leading our our. Uh, path, our vision and mission for this small organization. Um, what we do on the day to day is to support infectious disease research across the global south with open source data science and artificial intelligence tools. Um, we had a lot of expertise uh, on AI. Mikael uh, Hall academic career as a PhD and postdoc researcher was on AI um, for mostly non-communicable diseases. Eduardo had already transitioned from academia to building his own startup, so he had this experience. I kind of had a bit of community expertise, and both me and Mikel in different projects, different times, different situations, but we had already been working in the Global South, so we knew a bit about the communities we wanted to help. What we had no idea about was fundraising uh, for nonprofit, about building communities remotely, not in person, but really on a remote setting, and then around sensitive topic like neocolonialism in research, uh, helicopter research, you might have heard, uh, especially all around global health. Um, so we also had to learn a lot about that, understand the narrative, understand, um, read and, and basically listen to people so that we could build our organization um, with better values. Um, so it turned out just to summarize, because today we are talking about the open um, leadership path. I thought this was one I did the hardest for me. So transitioning, remember that my background is experimental. So transitioning to actually computer sciences. Um, but actually it was pretty easy. That was not easy. Sorry, I don't want to say that word, but that was doable. That wasn't where I had to uh, really, where I had to suffer the most. Um, and I think the key here is that I had 
mentorship. I had people I could look up to. I had good resources. I mean, to learn to code, there is a ton of resources. Uh, Mikael is really an expert, so he could teach me. Um, so that was actually not a difficult journey. It was long and I had to learn a lot, but not difficult. Something I had not anticipated as difficult. So this is me. Um, this is the pictures we took for our profiles, for our nonprofit and so on. So this is me, Gemma, the CEO, meaning the um, chief executive office um, officer or executive director of the organization, meaning I have a now, yes, for the first time in my life, a really 100% leadership role in an organization that is aiming to be open, that is aiming to serve and create a community. So of course, no surprise here, this actually has been the most difficult part um, because I don't have the training. I did not have that many mentors or people I could look up for. I did not have the resources. Um, and it's something that at the beginning, I really, really underestimated and I've been learning a lot in the last three years. Um, so just to, um, I just want to show in case you then have questions or want to follow up about the kind of community that we are building, if any of you is interested in talking more about that. So we are a very small team. We are two full-time people working. We have master's students, we have undergrad and graduate interns, and we work sporadically with um, data scientists um, per project. And we have a huge team of volunteers that have helped us um, uh, reach where we are. We then uh, have a network, uh, mostly in Africa. We work a lot with African scientists. Um, here are a few of the institutions that we are partnered with. We support the research projects. We provide the data science expertise. We provide um, training and capacity building activities and so on. We also interact with scientists, let's say generally in the global north. So well-funded organizations that can provide resources, and data um, internship opportunities, um, like the one we have open now, if you want to check. Um, and then we do network with people we call data contributors. So these are organizations that have been accumulating data that may be relevant to infectious disease research, such as Medicines for Malaria Adventure or the Swiss Tropical Health Institute and so on. So institutions that might want to help our mission by sharing what they have so that we can in turn share it with our community of beneficiaries of um, people we are trying to support and then finally and something unexpected that we are exploring a lot is how can we work with something called the big tech software engineers from github that you probably all know of by now as bank and other companies like digital ocean and so on so they provide volunteer time they provide their softwares and so on so how can we leverage these really professional tools and translate it into a scientific setting and particularly scientific setting adapted to low resourced communities. That's just the ones we find when working in the field. So this is the landscape that we are building, um, that we are trying to build very much community oriented. So we are trying to mix all these different kinds of people to get them to talk to each other, to get them to interact, to facilitate this, not only do science, but facilitate this kind of networks. Um, so to conclude, because I don't want to take too much time, I just want to say what has worked for me in all these career transitions and this not so traditional path to uh, leading a scientific initiative in the nonprofit sector, very much linked to academia, but a bit outside academia. So first and most importantly, finding existing communities that align with your values and vision and help each other grow. Um, of course, Open Life Sciences, um, the Software Sustainability Institute, Code for Science and Society, I can name quite a few that have helped us a lot in our path. Uh, try to get mentorship and coaching experiences. Um, as I said, the difference between uh, learning a skill you don't have um, when you have mentors, when you have people you can look up to, is so much different than learning a skill for which you don't have mentors or support. I could really see that um, when I started building Ericilia. Uh, it took me a while to realize leadership is actually a skill you need to learn. Um, so trying to get mentors and help um, for that, then um, trying to focus your work, your organization as a leader, you've got to make decisions. 
So always trying to um, focus on projects and organizations and people that align with your values, with your vision, with your way of working, that value your community, for example, that are going to contribute to your community and so on. If possible, it's always a plus. Um, giving opportunities uh, and freedom to those around you, meaning trying to expand the opportunities through your community, through your network. We have an amazing network of former interns that now go on and talk about their Ciliad conferences and so on. And we are extremely happy uh, to see that happening. So facilitating all these opportunities for people to grow in any capacity they can within your community, within your project, within your organization, your group. Um, and of course, except you will do many, many failures, uh, trying to learn from them the best you can. And uh, finally, openness, using open tools, open communication, meaning we work uh, with Slack and GitHub mostly. So we communicate there in the general channels. Our project management is done on GitHub. So anyone can actually see the tasks that we are working on, the contributions that are being done. And so, so trying to really uh, work in the open at all levels, decision-making, strategic making, project planning, and so on, is uh, really helps in engaging people around you in making them feel part of the project and motivated. And finally, do dedicate as much as possible. Um, we would love to have someone full-time dedicated to community building. We don't have, but really um, giving importance to this as a leader, um, someone that can care about the people around um, has become very, very important for us. And things that of course have not worked and not dedicating time as a leader to really strategic thinking and planning, meaning not answering emails, not working actively in the projects, but really sitting, analyzing the landscape and thinking, where are we leading? Where are we going uh, together? Where are we, uh, what is our future path? And asking others to chip in uh, their thoughts and their vision on that and revise frequently where you are in this path and trying to see where your organization or your project, I'm writing your organization, but I mean your group, your project, your community, wherever you are working, where are you standing, whereas where you should be standing or where you would want to be standing. Um, avoid the um, very attitude that uh, this a very typical attitude when you say, I'll just get this done, I'll just get that done, I'll just do that, I'll just do the other thing. Uh, this very quickly leads to stress and burnout. So be realistic about your time. Um, take care of yourself and those in your community. If you see someone with this attitude, for example, try to really um, help them prioritize and reduce um, the amount of commitment they are getting, for example. And then it has not worked either and um, when you try to work with people that is really not valuing the kind of organization or community that you are trying to build, uh, it makes it a very difficult relation. It complicates your life. Um, it makes you uh, not happy. So really trying to focus on what you want, uh, how you want to work and um, putting relevance and importance on that. I think it's, it's key. Um, um, for the leaders, it's a responsibility of the leaders to really try and identify those organizations and those people that will blend better with the work that, that you are doing. So I think that's it. I think I kept to the time, which is great. Um, I'm very happy to connect with any of you and chat. I'm on the OLS Slack, also LinkedIn, Twitter, and on the email if you need me. I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, thank you, thank you very much, um, Gemma. That was really a lot, and it was really a twist. The cycles part, it, it, it wasn't something that I thought about. Um, that was really great. Um, I see that we have um, like twenty seven minutes before the hour, so I would like um Nima to do her presentation, and then we can have kind of um a discussion on on the two, uh, presentation. So please, um, Nima. Yes, I'm going to share my slide and ask the usual question in a second. All right, can you see the full slide? Yes, lovely. 
Okay, hi everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me to your lovely community. Um, I've been invited to talk about my journey as the founder of Policy. And so I myself am a, I like to call myself a technologist, um, I'm an artist, and I'm also foraying into coaching. I think I have something to offer there based on my experiences, which I'll share. And just a quick background on policy. Um, policy is an organization I founded in 2017. And it's a feminist collective that is focused on data design and technology. And we try to look at the internet and the future of internet and data and digital tools through a feminist lens. And a lot of our work is focused on bringing a creative approach to these different conversations and technologies and trying to use art and and just trying to make the content more accessible to different populations. So trying to do away with jargon, trying to make the content just available in different formats. So whether that's, you know, podcasts, audios, artworks, murals, just really trying to get a broader conversation about these topics that are going to be very, very important in our lives. And they already are. Um, and even more so in the years to come. So trying to have a bigger conversation around that. So I wanted to start out with my my background, who I am, how did I get here? So um, Taj asked the question, what did you want to be when you know you were five? And I used to always say I wanted to be a pediatrician. And now that I look back, I was like, how did I know that word? Like, how, how did I know the word pediatrician when I was three years old? So that was clearly not my dream. This was somebody else's dream. And, but it was a dream that I pursued for a long time. And, you know, I went to the US for schooling, I, I studied pre-med, and then when it came time to like actually apply, that was when I finally woke up and I was like, you know what, this is not what I wanna do, this. Um, and so I was like, let me, let me go for a compromise and I studied uh, public health instead. So I got a master's degree in epidemiology I've never worked in the field. I feel like I'm, I was just a few years too early to really work on, on tech. I had loved tech my whole life. I loved video games. Um, my brother was encouraged to go into computer science and I wasn't, like I was pushed more towards help. Um, but then it comes around full circle. I just go through a very convoluted way to get back to where I feel like I should have been all along. So. Um, I got my master's degree and then that's when, you know, it was this time of when, you know, Twitter was going off and there was a lot of conversations about Africa rising. And at the time I was in the US and I was like, you know what, maybe this is not where I need to be. And, you know, I think there are much better opportunities if I just go back home, you know, where I'm from. So I actually grew up in, in Nigeria and I'm from other places, but that's where I grew up. And I was like, okay, let me go back, you know, somewhere within Africa, somewhere close to maybe where my mom is from. And I ended up landing in Uganda, which is a country I didn't know anything about. I actually remember before I got there, I was like Googling, like, what does Kampala look like? Um, just because it was so different for me. And I ended up working at a company that was doing M health projects. I was like, I can still be related to health. And then Within a few months, I dropped the health altogether and I just started working on mobile technology, um, looking at text-based programs, voice-based programs. And I realized that you could collect a lot of data much more cheaply than you ever could. You could reach people across African countries in local languages using voice-based technologies and you can collect really, really massive amounts of data. And But that's really what got me thinking about the way that governments are using this data and I was seeing that private sector was using this data you know to have more business but I felt like governments were still very inefficient um, as they are and so I left the job that I had and I started this company called Policy and at the time I was very inspired by service design so countries that were building their services on digital platforms and making it easier for citizens to engage with the government because I felt that, you know, in African countries, every time you need to, wherever there's a touch point with government, it's just an unpleasant experience. You have to wait in a the line. There's a lot of uncertainty. And that was what I really wanted to work on. I really wanted to use data to improve all these different experiences that you have when you work with governments. Um, 
but the issue came when I realized that actually, you know what, I was very naive and it is very difficult to work with governments, especially when you're just young and you don't have any money and you don't have foreign backing and you're not a donor. And so there I was, I had started this organization and I was trying to actually figure out how would we do what we wanted to do. And, you know, I'd already quit my job, so I didn't have other sources of income. I didn't have any starting capital. And one of the first things I did was let me I was entering a whole new field and I was trying to establish myself as someone who knew what they were doing even though I felt like sometimes I didn't and so one of the first things that I focused on was trying to put out short communications about what I was doing and so one of the first arms of the company that I built out is our communications department and so when I would meet people they'd be like oh I've seen your organization like how many people are you and I would be like oh we're just two um, and it'd be like, what? You know, I, um, we thought there would be more. And so that I started to use my art and I started to use, you know, this way of bringing information, visualizing data as, as I was trying to figure out how would I work with governments? How would I make open data more interesting to them? How could I even get into the rooms that I wanted to get into? So that's sort of where I was. And it was it was definitely very hard. So for the first year, it was it just felt like I was trying to find my footing and, and trying to figure out where would I fit in. And there were many times when I doubted myself and I doubted if I was going in the right direction, if this was a worthwhile pursuit. And I was doing like many consultancies on the side to keep the lights on kind of thing. And then um, two years in, I ended up going to this amazing meeting that you know really changed the trajectory of the organization. And it was called the Feminist Internet Research Network. And it took place in Malaysia. And that was my my first foray into feminist internet. So I had never studied anything related to feminism. I think I was, I've was i always been a feminist, but I had never read the texts or knew the language that I used in these communities. And then to see this mashup of feminism and digital technology that was just very eye-opening and it was a really beautiful experience. And I realized then that, you know, this is what I want to do. This is what makes me come alive like trying to figure out how you can build digital tools um, using feminist methodologies, whether you're doing the research or the implementation or even just building a feminist organization that, you know, everything that we did after then was really aimed at this. And so the project that I did here was looking at online violence against women. And this was like back in the day um, in five African countries. So we went to capital cities and we went on the ground and we spoke to women in markets, in hospitals, just women on the streets to understand their experiences with the internet and also just their access and like what kinds of tools do they use. And then COVID happened. And this was a very big changing point for me again, because for the first time I had time to just think, to just stop and think. And we had already written, you know, the whole research. And then in March, 2020, one of my mentors said, um, yeah, you've done this research, but it's not novel. Like, yes, we know that women experience violence, like, so what? And I was like, you know what, you're totally right. And then I rewrote the whole paper um, from scratch because I had nothing else to do. You know, like I finally had the time to sit and do this this work that I found really interesting, but I had never had the time to like really have this deep thinking and actually do it. And so um, I rewrote this paper and it really resonated with a lot of people. And I think that this was really one of the catalyzers that re really led to our growth. And the other thing with COVID was that because I had already set up the organization to be remote first, that it didn't really change the way we worked. In fact, I think that was when we got more work than we had ever had in the past. And that really led to our growth from then as a research think tank, feminist collective, you know, based in the global South. And so from there, we um, the organization really took off. And a really interesting thing is that now we could hire people from other countries as well before we only had staff in Uganda. But because of COVID, it became very acceptable that you could hire people from anywhere. And so we were able to get some really amazing talent into the organization and people who challenged me, and we got really interesting research work. Um, and then we started to play with different forms, formats. So we built games, we developed a mockumentary, we worked with artists to create data murals, we 
made songs, we made dances, all around data. We were just trying to think of what are all the ways that you can engage with people for them to understand what is data and why does it matter to them, like just on, on a very basic level. And a lot of our work has been directly with communities and um, different communities. So what do artists think of data or what does local government think of data? What do dancers think of data? Um, and so bringing all these different groups together just gives a really rich perspective on on what we would like, like what would we like to do with our data? How would we like to store it? How would we like to govern it? And just involving everyone in those kinds of conversations um, has been really enriching. And now, you know, all these years later, when I found it so difficult to work with governments, like we've finally come full circle where governments invite us to meetings. We just had a meeting yesterday where we had done a big research project in several districts across Uganda, where we spoke to local government to understand data, um, how they view data governance. And so we held a meeting yesterday with the Ministry of ICT and other stakeholders and presented this framework for data governance in Uganda. So it feels really fulfilling that, you know, six years later, we're finally where we wanted to be originally. Um, it just took us a more indirect path. And, you know, it's interesting that we can even talk to governments about things like feminist data and they actually give us an audience and they're actually interested in talking about like, yeah, gender disaggregated data and what you can use it for, what you can do with it. So it's been super fun. It's been really interesting to grow um, the organization. I think we have about 35 to 40 staff across Africa right now. And we're doing some really, really fun work. Um, just to add, so, I mean, it was not easy. Like there were a lot of challenges, um, a lot of challenges with things like human resource, like finance, um, Fundraising, yeah, keeping the lights on, but also the type of funding you would get. So at the beginning, we would only get like project-based funding, which is really difficult. I think, um, as Gemma had mentioned, that if you don't have time for strategic thinking, if you're always jumping from project to project, it's really difficult to see the big picture. And then finally, uh, three years in, we were able to get unrestricted funding, which just allowed us to grow so much because we had the space to breathe and actually think about how what what will this organization look like um so that brings me to today uh i stepped down from the role of executive director in august um and yeah it was it had been six years and i knew this from the start that my time at policy would be something like um five to six years because I just feel that organizations should just have new leadership after a certain amount of time. Um, and also just for personal reasons, I had to move to Australia for family reasons and the time zone is just insane. It's 10 o'clock here right now. And it's, yeah, it's absolutely stunning and I love living here, but it also didn't really make sense to run the organization from, from such a far distance. And I also felt that the organization was in a place where it could be given to someone else and and that I would trust that somebody else would would take it in a, in whatever direction they they see fit. So right now I just play an advisory role just from a distance. I'm just available to staff if they need to tap in. Um, but other than that, I'm really enjoying watching watching what everyone's doing from a distance and just really happy with how everything turned out in the past six years. So that's me. I live by the beach. This is my website, nimaya.com. Feel free to reach out to me. There's a contact form on there if you want to reach me, or you can reach me on socials. They're all probably Nimaya as well. So thank you so much for giving me the space to talk about my journey. Um, thank you, Nima. That was really, really interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, I think this uh, since Gemma will be leaving in the next 15 minutes, it's good to take some questions and then um, kind of bounce it off both of you. Uh, maybe you share um, something. I will be selfish and start with something that I wrote in the in the ether part. So um, Gemma mentioned something in what didn't work for them in like, um, let me read that. I wrote that down. Um, do not revise frequently where you are. So that's um something that I, I think might be interesting. And if you can 
put a little bit more information on, mm -hmm. on that. Sure. Yes. Uh, so just mind you, this is something we have actually started doing like way too late. Uh, uh, so there are different ways in which you uh, we are doing it. So one, of course, is a typical having your what they call it. KPIs, um, which is more a startup like name, but is you have certain goals where you want to get, um, and, and you measure, right? You just measure, I don't know. Uh, I wanted to just to put a metric that we try not to use, but we use, uh, publish three papers and I only published one. Um, but more importantly, I think what we've started doing and now that we've been working in the field, uh, for a bit longer is we have all these amazing organizations doing fantastic work. So we've kind of built maps uh, of networks um, across African researchers, um, other researchers somewhere, other places in the world, but also or other organizations supporting scientific research and so on. And we try to evaluate where are we, what are our nodes in the network? Are we hitting the connections that we want? Are we helping the people that we want to help? Are we working with organizations that we want to work with? Or are we maybe too much focused on like a particular note of the network? So we should try to. Um, so I think that this network kind of mind um, has helped us more than the actual uh, measuring the K KPIs per se. Yeah, so you build maps, it's like, okay, this organization is connected with this one, which is funded by that one, and works in collaboration with this one and with this one. So is this a group I am really aligned with in terms of mission, of values, of work they are doing? If yes, then I should be trying to get more connections in there so that I can see if we can work together. So that's what why we say where we stand literally in the map. Um, that's really interesting. Um, Nima, what do you have a take on that? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, so Gemma in her presentation mentioned something about what didn't work for them is frequent revision of where they are. And I think I wanted to get um, um the will is that the case for you or um what has Will that be something that you advise against as well, or is that something that has worked for you? Did you say frequent revision of a plan? Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, no, I was all about pivots and constant revision of plans. I think you have to be because, because yeah, you have all these assumptions when you go in and then you learn quickly that either they're not true or or they just don't work out. I'm um, like, yeah, I think just what I wanted to initially do and what we ended up doing, I think are, are very far away from each other. And I think the other thing that I really struggled with, and I think I just have to accept that it's part of my personality, is that I just want to do too many things at the same, like all together, because I think it's all interesting. It's like, okay, it's AI and it's data and it's governance. And and then I know that internally we struggled with people and just like, like, who are we? Like, are we just like, are we doing labor rights, digital labor rights? Are we like, and I was like, it's just anything to do with the internet, just anything that touches the, and I think people just really, really struggled with that direction that you can focus on. So, and the thing is like, especially with technology, digital technology, like they change so quickly. And so two years ago, you know, maybe people were talking, maybe we're talking about AI today and then two years from now, you know, no one will be talking about it. Who knows? But it just, the cycles move so quickly and you sort of, if you're in that space, you have to move with it. You have to be flexible and adaptable. So I think I'm all for changing your mind, accepting that maybe the st strategy you chose was a mistake or just didn't make sense and, and pivoting. I, I think there's no shame in, in changing your mind at all. Um, That's really interesting, Tick. Uh, I would read a question from the Etherpad for this question was written after Gemma's presentation. How did you and your co-founders learn about funding and neocolonialism issues? Uh, books, seminars, new collaborations? Okay. Um, great question. I think very different. Funding, meaning funding as in fundraising support. Um, so I think these are uh, two very different topics. So in the aspect of funding and fundraising and so on, we learned a lot by looking at the startup programs 
Um, so we were very lucky to be part of a nonprofit accelerator called Fast Forward, and we hope to be part of more in the future. We also were part of the digital infrastructure incubator by Code for Science and Society. So this kind of startup programs help a lot. And then in terms of understanding how science is being done um, and, and how it has to change partially by reading a lot, but then by uh, talking to people and and trying to really work. So at Arcelia, we really value working for real with our collaborators, so spending time there, understanding how they work and listening to them, um, trying to be part of their communities. So basically a lot of reading and a lot of, of listening and reflecting upon, upon things that we do normally or that we've seen done normally that may actually not be that great, but we just accept them as they are because they have been around forever, right? So having this um, critical mind about about things that you consider for granted. Um, thank you. Um, Nima, um, what has been your case in terms of space maybe funding? Yeah, really good one. Um, uh funding i think for me what's worked most is partnerships like conversations i think like applying for open calls it just feels like just you know you're one out of a thousand and the odd the, and the amount of effort that you put into it and what you get back it's just it doesn't feel worth worth it and so what i think has worked for me is build like going to call like if when i go to a conference a goal is that you meet someone and you get some money in the next six months. Like you start those conversations. Um, I was just talking to someone about the longest one that I had where I started talking to someone. I think it took four years. And that's just what it is. It sometimes it just takes that long, but eventually it comes through and they become one of your biggest funders and then they fund you for years. But I think it's so important to just get those conversations and get someone to have a call that that has been the thing that's always worked for me just really prior like prioritizing your networks as much as possible and 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 doing good work so that people drop your names in different rooms you know in a positive way i think those are the, the two best ways to go um interesting i i guess what i'm getting from both of you is networking it can be in different ways, but importantly, the way to get funding is through networking. Um, we have about three minutes before Gemma. Maybe there is a question. Um, we have another one here. Um, so the question is: I agree with alignment between values and vision, but getting the financial sustainability part is the trickiest part. I'm not sure if this is was in the global south. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Definitely, I think. This is for all organizations. So anyone that has to raise money wherever they are based, it's difficult in some places, more difficult than others. And of course, um, you may be in a position where you cannot say no to certain projects. Um, so this is something that, yeah, you need to balance out and really uh, make a strategic decisions. And sometimes you may be able to to have more a chance of choosing what kind of projects you engage with and, and some others you may need to, um, yeah, to uh, to decide to work on certain projects that maybe are not 100% what you would like. I think this is ends up being a very strategic um, decision for the whole team. If I The only thing I can recommend if you ever find yourself in, in such a position is to, to open it to the whole community. So everyone that may be affected by your decision to work on a certain project or not and discuss very openly like do we engage in this project this is going to take so many resources um with that result um do we want to do that do we not and and get a an a, agreement or at least an understanding from everyone if, if that's possible of course yeah. um thank you so um nima it's really interesting that your work is also in the global south so how has that been for you just in general or in fund in terms of funding 
I think um, in terms of funding, kind of how sustainability of funding. Mm. It's been okay, but the, the funding pool for tech and society is very small. Like there's five to six players. Um, and then there's the usual, you know, government agencies like Hivo, CEDA, um, and then the smaller ones. So it does feel finite that it's very, you know, I feel like we've tapped into all the ones that we possibly could. And that now it's, it's becoming important for us to find other networks of funders. So also, I mean, the thing that also worked for us is that we could go both after tech, but also women's rights organizations. So that opened up the pool a little bit more, but I mean, it is precarious. It definitely is. And that's why we're trying to figure out other means of, of, of other partners, other kinds of collaborations where, you know, it would make sense. So yeah, I mean, we're okay for now, but I mean, it, it's still, it feels like things can change very easily. Um, thank you. I, on the hour mark, um, Jama will be leaving us now. Thank you very much for joining. It was really interesting talking to you. Thanks so much. I'm sorry I have to go, but I couldn't move the other meeting. But yeah, I'm gonna watch your talk. I wanna hear about it. Okay. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um. So I think uh we should um have the presentation from you and then. We can talk more for the remaining few minutes that we have. Um, thank you, Leo, please. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm actually ridiculously flattered to have been invited to talk uh, careers at my own organization. <laughs> um, but yes, I, I especially want to thank Berenice for nominating me for this. Um, so I'm. I decided uh, if I, if I, if, I, if I can talk in memes, where we're going, we don't need slides. Um, so I, I I didn't prepare slides. It's another way of trying to make it cool to say that I didn't have any slides today. Um, and I am coming after a couple of amazing other speakers. Nima, I really, really enjoyed hearing about your work. Um, and it's also seriously beautiful slides. Like, wow. And um, if the line artist was you, do you do commissions? Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so, oh, sorry. I do commissions, but that art is not mine. That's Canva, which is a very great software. Canva, <laughs> okay. Canva does everything. I really need to it play does. With it. It has so many AI tools now. It's crazy. It, like the $10, every time I pay it, I'm like, I'm ripping you guys off. This is too little money. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Nice one. Okay. Um. So you if you're watching this uh you probably have a pretty good idea that uh i am executive director of ols and one of four uh, directors the executive in my title basically just means that i'm lucky enough to have a little bit more paid time than the other directors uh it doesn't mean that i have any more responsibility or authority um so i've i've been thinking about if i did have slides how i would um how i could do this talk uh, and it, making it look all swish and fun. And one thing that occurred to me is that I could say, for example, I've I did a bachelor's in computer science, and I've done a doctorate uh, with the University of Manchester in computer science. Um, and I worked at the University of Cambridge for five years, and I probably have about twenty years experience coding. Um, and then. I take all those things which I've listed in what sounds like a normal order and I pretty much reverse them because I've been coding since about 2000 um, and I'm writing out the amendments for my doctoral thesis right now. Um, and I worked at Cambridge for five years uh, and when I started at Cambridge, I didn't hadn't even finished my bachelor's. Um, so I I, um, I shuffled it up. I did it as backwards as you could have managed just about. Um, and by the time I actually completed my bachelor's and started working at Cambridge, I had a lot of experience as a software engineer um, and before that as a tech support. So for another five years, I was that person, that really annoying person on the other end of the line who's like, have you turned it off and on again? All right, go under your desk, unplug that cable and plug it back in. No, did you really do it? Yeah, no, I don't believe you. <laughs> no, I wasn't quite that mean. Um, but uh, 
yeah, I um my first jobs that were more than gender appropriate teenage money earning, such as babysitting. My first jobs were um I had a few days working at shops or longer term. I um I worked for the NHS, that's the UK's health system, uh, sending faxes and importing data from faxes that were sent to me into a computer. And sometimes some of my colleagues in the social work department would give me handwritten um, letters and I would type them up for them because even typing wasn't necessarily a skill that my colleagues were expected to have. I'm very curious if that's still a thing these days or if you expect that someone in the workplace has to be able to type and produce their own letters. <laughs> um, and I actually, I'm going to put everyone on the spot now. I'm super curious. I've given some hints talking about my work experience, but if you said how old I was, I would love to see some guesses in the chat for my age. And you can't, you can't offend me. <laughs> Oh, okay. We're doing good. The last time someone guessed, so um, just for the recording, we've we've got guesses right now between thirty-seven and forty-five. Pass. Yes, <laughs> those are good numbers. Um, but last time someone guessed last week, they were like, "Wait, you're not old enough for a young person's rail card," which in the UK is for people between sixteen and twenty-five. And it's just like, <laughs> um, no, no, I'm old enough to have a kid. You could have that rail card. I'm 38. Um, <laughs> but people often miss um, uh, underestimate significantly how old I am, uh, perhaps because I've mixed up my career stages, you know, and I say I'm still wrapping up my doctoral studentship um, or like someone I'd worked with for five years said to me, yo, are you, you, you you're older than 30. And I'm like, well, if if not, then I must have been an absolute baby when we first met, and I came with experience as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I I I've mixed everything up, and I don't always end up like when people ask you for that drop down for things like you know what's your career stage. It's like well, I found in my own organization, I have twenty years experience coding, and I'm a doctoral student what do you actually want to know here? Because I could select about three of those different options on the box. Um, and I think I think so far my career has been acceptable. If I throw this again more in order, um, 20 years ago, uh, do, doing those faxes, moved into tech support because I knew I wanted to work in tech. Um, I think I already wanted to be a programmer, but like I didn't have any experience, didn't have a degree because I had moved to the UK on a marriage visa. And actually, if you're on a marriage visa, you have to have a job or be independently wealthy. And so I wanted to go to university, but couldn't because you have to have a job. Um, and so my bachelor's took nine years, which is why by the time that I actually graduated, I was at Cambridge and I had, you know, hands on experience as a software engineer. And then when I was at Cambridge, I kind of figured out that I couldn't move my career further forwards because I only had a bachelor's and Cambridge kind of expects that you have perhaps like 97 doctorates. No, just kidding. And I never even did a master's. So I went straight from bachelor's to PhD. Uh, well, technically, it's an eng -D, doctor of engineering. And I guess until I get my corrections in, even that I shouldn't claim, but don't tell anyone. A couple of times I've put doctor on that registration form and it feels so good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Cambridge, I wasn't my first experience in academia. I'd worked in industry spin outs as a software engineer. Uh, that were very, very academia adjacent. Um, and that's where I first started caring about open source and about open science because I'd seen grant money. Uh, <laughs> sorry, just laughing at chat. Uh, I'd seen grant money that had gone to small companies that didn't actually um, do anything. They they made code and it was closed. And I'm just like, what's the, po what's the point of this grant money going anywhere if actually it's some closed source code that no one ever used? It just seemed like such a waste. Uh, and then after five years of um, working at Cambridge, I started, um, you may have heard the story before, but I started working community uh, from a software engineering role because people said, yo, you use Twitter, right? Um, 
and ne- five years later I'm a community manager <laughs> it was it was a slippery slope of me slowly like managing pull requests on GitHub and interacting with people and running internship programs and in fact I know we've got at least one person on this call who I who I have met through internship programs so you'll know how much I love 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 onboarding newbies it's like one of my biggest biggest loves is seeing how someone that you met when they were trying out one of their early jobs or first jobs or first steps in tech and then looking at them five years later it's like look at what they're doing and I knew them earlier and it's just like damn you're good (laughs) um and so that's part of the reason why OLS is super special to me as well it's perhaps um a career stage or two further forwards than um let's say a tech internship because often people are undergrads or uh, doctoral students or postdocs or independent adults at some other point um in their career um but I still get to see what people do later on um and even though I didn't do it I can still take a little tiny bit of pride watching all of the amazing things that everyone's doing um and I think I don't need to go too much into details like Gemma covered. Scientists just don't just don't teach leadership skills and interpersonal skills, which is just such a shame um, because like I've been bullied in academia. Um, I, I know scenarios where I might have dropped out or left if not for people who were willing to look after me. And I've yet to see a single human being in academia who hasn't ended up scarred by academia. Um, So for me, that took the form of uh, co-creating with the other directors an organization that was outside academia, trying to drive culture change that a lot of it is targeted towards academia. I don't want to pretend it's only academia, because if you're a researcher that's independent or no intent of ever going back to academia, you're still cool and I think you are awesome. <laughs> um, I think part of our goal with this with these talks really is to make sure that people recognize that careers in and around research are successful no matter what, so long as you're doing something that pays pays bread, pays bread, puts bread on the table or pays the bills. Um, and if you're lucky, uh, if you're really, really lucky, we hope it's something that makes you happy as well. Um but yeah, my mine ended up being lucky enough to be paid three days a week to work on this. And uh, so, so much of what Gemma and Nima has been saying about the raising the funding and the stress around that, it's real, but it's totally worth it. Um, I'm just rambling about how much I love my job. So I think I'll shut up and we can do questions. <laughs> um, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, so I would want to come back to a question for Nima that's in the other part. Um, so the question was, um, science plus art collaboration. What point points or what pain points or difficulties you observe in these types of interaction? And also do you think bringing in very different discipline is the um, most for reaching large number of people slash many communities? So in terms of art and science, I haven't come across any huge pain points. I We had this project called Create Your Kampala where we worked with artists and local communities. So we had collected data from the local communities and the artists were visualizing them. And it was my first time doing a project like that. And you could definitely see like the artists didn't really get the concept of data. I think you could have done a better onboarding into like what what data is but or maybe it was that maybe we had rigid views of what data is and that they had internalized in a totally different way um so of course they're speaking different languages but um generally no major pain points i think that art what's the word like it amplifies the work of science i feel like they kind of go hand in hand um so i don't think there's any clash there and in terms of having different groups in communities, it's not a must for sure. Like you can have a data science group that's just data scientists and there's there's nothing wrong with that. It's It totally works. Um, but when you bring different voices in, it just makes a much richer conversation, but it can definitely slow you down. So one thing that I notice, especially in the Ugandan context, um, we have a couple of trainings that are just for women. So we noticed that when we did open trainings that women would never ask questions, they would never raise their hands. Um, And so we 
have like normal bigger events and we have events that are much smaller and just for women and there's much more participation and um conversation but what you end up seeing is that it's very difficult to move forward because you're always starting from the from a beginner level so it's always like intro to something and you never get to like actually building something or actually like going somewhere so yeah, bringing in diverse communities, it's it's fun, it's rich, but you're going to go a lot slower than if you just went with, with single communities. But yeah, it's just if you want to go slow or fast or, you know, depends on what your goals are. I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, just a follow up uh, on that. So, um. I'm trying to understand like the concent the current um working strategy for policy, it's more on working with the locals in Uganda or um is this across more African countries? It's across um many different African countries. So this year a lot of our work has been focused on expanding to Francophone and Lusophone countries. So we had a pretty big presence in East Africa. We've done work in Ethiopia, but this year we try, we try to do a bigger push because when we had, when we've done research in those countries, just the level, the level of conversation is very, very, very different from Anglophone Africa. And it's also just, it is also just unfortunate that um, Lusophone is um, Portuguese. So it's Angola, Mozambique. Um, it's just a very different level of conversation that you can have, like, and it, it's also unfortunate that we have to divide Africa in this way as well. So one story that I love to say is that when we did research in Angola, we found out that women in Angola were looking to women in Brazil um, for, as peers, as people to learn from rather than looking for people in neighboring countries, just because the language was such a barrier. Um, so yeah, we're trying to expand. I mean, our dream would be to work across all African countries, um, but we're like, yeah, slowly getting there. So this year we're doing Francophone. We have someone working for us in Mozambique, and then hopefully we can keep expanding from there. And yeah, and, in, and it's, I mean, it's very expensive to work with local communities. Like you would think it would be cheaper, but it's not. It's very expensive. Like, you know, logistics itself is such a nightmare to to get to these communities. And then just where will you stay? What will you do? The safety of road travel. So it can be very expensive. Like, in, in fact, sometimes, you know, you have a lot of these meetings across Africa where you meet at fancy hotels and you have workshops, you know, in these beautiful buildings. And sometimes those are cheaper than trying to go into communities because it's so expensive just to get on the road and go there. So challenges all around yeah that's interesting and i think i i, I share that um concern about um different um when you go to francophone um african countries the it's usually kind of different from english speaking african countries also uh with the portuguese speaking yeah so uh we have a question for you and is how did the OLS organizational structure was decided, who was involved, any suggestions for anyone attempting to create the leadership structure of a community? So, um, difficult one. This might be one where I say, do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> which is embarrassing. Um, so, um, honestly, Berenice and Malvika and Emmy and I, we, um, the four directors, we all worked in the same domain, bioinformatics. Um, and at the time, like I'd met Malvika at some conferences and I met Berenice at some conferences. Um, and we'd all participated in the same Mozilla program, uh, which was wrapped up. We we're like, you know, a child of that program. Um, and I was, okay, Emmy was in Cambridge at the time and like I was doing a study group with Emmy and Emmy said uh, she was going to be applying to this Mozilla like spin out program um, for her work uh, at eLife at the time and 
I totally didn't have time. I was a new grad student. I'm like, I do not have time to do side projects. Do not have time to do side projects. That's what I said to myself over and over. Uh, of course, you know, that's not true because we're here. This this side project is now my main project. Um, but uh, I managed to convince myself that it was going to make sense because a lot of my research is into online communities um, and so running my own online community made a lot of sense. I was like, okay, I can justify this. Yay! I've talked myself into doing something I wanted to do anyway. Um, and so when Berenice and Malvika, I, I was at a conference in Freiburg in Germany, and Berenice like sort of mentioned that she was thinking about doing this Mozilla program as well. I'm like, oh, so was I. Shall, shall we play together? Um, so it was luck and like Emmy actually ran a separate program innovation leaders for the first round um and then she moved on to new jobs and so she joined us instead we were lucky enough to get her expertise as well um but the formal structure didn't come into it honestly uh until late last year like we knew that we were directors but we hadn't agreed on specific roles and we knew we had to grow up a bit because we finally had the resources and time to do more than just exhaustedly figure out the very next foot to put in front of us. Um, and Chan Zuckerberg had given us money, so we were able to actually start spending time to think about things rather than just survival mode. Um, so at that point, after um, we, we, we sat down in our retreat and we talked about the bits we like to do and we assigned roles. So that's why Berenice works as the... Um, director of technology and learning so the website for example um, and the cohorts and the pedagogy uh, is something that Berenice focuses on Emmy focuses on finance and ops so um, she's she she's the one who approves the budget you have to be very very nice to her um, don't worry she's lovely and so it's by design, but later than it should have been is probably the way I would say. But that, and I, I think that wouldn't work for a lot of people. Um, we have a very, very high trust environment between the four of us where we know if we are understanding something, that we explain it and we'll figure out why. If you're in a scenario where maybe that kind of relationship won't work, then I would highly recommend defining things early on uh, because conflicts are awful. And friendship breakups and work friendship breakups are awful. So happenstance is a bad idea. <laughs> okay, that was interesting. I would want to follow up, but I think there is a question for <laughs> both of um, you and Nima. So it's on conflict resolution. How have you dealt with severe or sort of severe conflict between partners? Did you, for example, reach out to conflict mediation organizations? Who wants to go first? You or Nima? Yeah, Nima? Happy to go first. Uh, just drop them. Life is short. <laughs> um, you know, when I was first starting out, I came across, I mean, you know, Gemma mentioned that um, I think in her scenario, I was on the other, I'm on the other side where there's a lot of colonialish, imperialist behavior to African organizations where, I mean, it happens all the time where people just doubt your abilities to do anything. Um, and I just will not tolerate it. And I had to, I think, I've never regretted where I've dropped a partner like that because there's, how do you salvage that relationship when you fundamentally don't see me as an equal human being. I just don't see where it's gonna go from there. So a lot of the times I dropped I dropped relationships. I have not regretted a single one that I have. Um, the people who value you, they will value you and you'll see it. Um, I mean, yeah, you. I mean, I didn't even know that you could go to a conflict resolution. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing, but it was, um, yeah, like this funding we have returned back we got into relationships and then I was like, oh, it's not going to work out. Just here's the money back. Because it's also just, it's so draining and demoralizing for your colleagues as well. Because we know it's happening. We can see it's happening and it's 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 unfair. And and yeah, we just don't need that kind of stress in our lives. Um, especially when you're young and you're just, you're balancing so many different things. So 
I often say just let it go, but maybe I think that's, I know a lot of people wouldn't go with that approach, but that's what's worked for me. Yo. I, <laughs> I think as uh, someone who tries very, very hard not to be a colonialist organization, but may make missteps uh, through sheer goodwill, my my gentle entreaty would be at least let people know what they've done wrong and if they can fix it because uh, that would that would be my my worst fear personally from my side I can't change where I was born um you know <laughs> uh, but I can try and do my best uh I think one of my my most genuine fears is treading over people but not knowing and continuing to do it with no chance of fixing that um in terms of answering the original question and severe conflict, um, it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, I, I have had scenarios where it felt like there was nothing I could do but change my essential being uh, in order to make the other party happy. Um, or, you know, simply stop having any will and any opinion is the only way where we could work together properly. Um, and in that case, yeah, at that point, there's, if there's nothing you can do, then all you're going to be doing is giving yourself stress. Uh, but there's also um, a middle ground, right? If you see that maybe we're communicating badly, like I say X and someone hears Y and Obviously, I know their intent is good, and I know my intent was good, but something happened in the middle. Um, maybe it's culture, maybe it's personalities. It's so, so hard. Um, but sometimes getting a third party who doesn't have skin in the game can be helpful. Um, I'm still trying to learn how to phrase this because I worry that sometimes people see this as like, mommy and daddy are divorcing now and we're deciding who gets the kids. But actually it's more like mommy and daddy don't want to divorce. We love the kids and each other and we wanna figure out what we can do so we don't have to have that divorce. Um, but phrasing it in a way that both both parties understand that can be a challenge if you, if you see this as barely bothering a formality that you have to do at the end. Um, so I don't have good answers but I have experience that's been tough and that I learned from. <laughs> um, thank you, Yo. So a follow-up for both of you. Um, would conflict resolution, whether severe conflict or non-severe, uh, kind of the way you manage it, be in line with the principle or the values of your organization? I'm not sure I saw the question there, sorry. Oh yeah, so let me repeat that. So like when you have, when there is a conflict, whether it's severe or not, um, the way you approach it, uh, I think different organizations have different values. So would that values be kind of the the norm or the, the, the way you try to resolve that? Or would, uh, would you take a, a, a step or a process where might not be um, in line with the values of your organization, but because that's the best thing to do at that point. I think you can twist your values to, to fit in. Cause I could say, okay, you know, feminist self-care is to cut toxic people out of my life and then, you know, um, justify that decision. But then on the other hand, I'm also like, well, we're not really being empathetic. We're not really opening the channels of communication. We're not trying to resolve it. So, I mean, you could definitely twist it to 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 mold to what you're trying to, to do. But it's interesting because we've been trying to, you know, we call ourselves a feminist collective. And there's a lot of internal dispute and conversation even about that terminology okay, if you call yourself a feminist organization, what does that mean? And so there's a lot of calling out and and I appreciate it where people will be like, you know, you call yourself one thing, but you act this way. And I always want to tell us like, yeah, but we're we're learning, you know, we're a project in 
in motion and we, we learn and we try to do better. So yeah, a big thing is about being open and, and transparent about the decisions that we make, but I mean, we're still on that journey. I'll second uh, kind of what you said, Nima, but in a slightly different way. Um, I'm just thinking about the the golden rule, the do unto others as would be done to uh, you have done to you. Um, but if you extrapolate that, it doesn't mean um, like feed people only food that I like, right? That wouldn't make sense. But instead, think about if you were in their shoes, how would you like to be treated? And that is a way, a more maybe flexible and compassionate way of living with your own values um not saying my value is hard but my values flex to encompass the people around me and how they interact with the world as well and that doesn't mean sacrifice everything you care about like there's no scenario where I'm going to because of someone else's values I don't know eat meat right I'm vegan um but there's a, there's often lots of middle ground if you just say okay here are the givens what what can we do um thank you both so i we are at the official end of the call so if anyone wants to leave please um you're free to do that if nima and you have a few minutes and we have a few other questions uh maybe we can take them yes we have a hand uh, can I? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion. It was very interesting to to hear your, your perspectives. Um, I wanted to ask um, if you have any uh, suggestions of programs or tr uh, training that one could follow if they want to go more towards like leadership and uh, yeah, career. well, starting organizations in the context of open science is something that I'm looking now for. Uh, of course, we're here at the OLS and looking for some <laughs> training, but if you have other ideas that uh, could be interesting to look at. I don't, I think this is for you. <laughs> Um, there are other organizations that offer different programs, like there's OpenScapes, um, or at some point next year, NASA's um, Open Science Online MOOC will be launched. Uh, OLS will also be teaching a version of that. And honestly, I think if you've been through OLS, I would be surprised if there's anything new beyond more astronomy examples. <laughs> but um, those are definitely things to look out for. And I mean, there's like, there's a lot of organizations that focus on this and make MOOCs. Um, Google might be what you want here, honestly. Um, but I haven't been through some of the newer programs. Oh, the Turing Way. Always get involved with the Turing Way. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, no, yeah, I was looking for the, there was one open science MOOC that I found today. And uh, that is also like I mentioned in the European Commission, I think, website. But it seems quite under development. So I couldn't really get much out of it yet. Uh, so I was just looking for other possibilities. Thanks. Or, yeah, any other questions? I'm going through the chat, maybe if I miss something. Oh, yeah. Finding, so there is a question, I think, from Derek. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Finding children of the Mozilla program is a really good way into making this work. Uh, what do you do when there are other mentorship programs who seem to be unaware of this program and are a bit lost? I guess that's one for me. Uh, unless you've done any Mozilla spawned programs, I'm not aware of Nima. <laughs> um, Sorry, yeah, I'll just, yeah. Can I just articulate my my, my question? I, I'm I've been involved in other projects, and I don't want to mention names, but th there really is a sense of having contributed to this project for a long time um, in a voluntary capacity, and and I'm starting to feel exploited rather than kind of. Um, um, being grown 
And I don't quite know how to deal with that feeling because I, I support their ideals, but it feels like the funding that they are getting is going to them and it's not actually supporting supporting me. And and I'm very I, I support their ideals, but 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 I'm a bit unsure as to how deal, to deal with it. Thanks. I'm gonna take a Leo Faranema's book and say drop it like it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've had scenarios where in an open source organization or an open community organization where I felt exploited. Um, and I think given a lot of my doctorate is about open research and about open science and about open communities, one of the toughest things for me was in the course of my research, realizing that um, open source is capitalism uh, in extreme because it's capitalism that's figured out how to not pay a single bleeding cent to the people working for them. Um, now we all we all work in a capitalistic and live in a capitalistic society. We have to put bread on the table. So to some degree, we have to embrace and recognize that fact. Um, but if you're working for an organization, it's one thing if they're volunteers, right? If if like when we started OLS, we didn't have money. It was a side project. Of course, we weren't paying people, but once money started coming in, we weren't going to be paying only ourselves and not our community. Um, and sometimes that's a radical concept. People are like, that's really hard. How am I going to pay someone? But if your value is equity, then you recognize that one, if you aren't like paying back people that you're working with, then you're only getting volunteers who have the luxury of time, which is unequally distributed. And two, you will burn people out and just work through them and work through them and they get a new bunch of privileged folks, burn them out and get, and that's, that's the only way you can work. Um, if you have money, honestly, I do strongly, strongly feel like you need to make sure that you're looking after people. That doesn't mean volunteering is bad. I will say that a million times. If you have the time and you want to volunteer, do, but try not to be exploited. Um, thank you, Leo. Um, Nima, you want to add to that? Um, any other questions? Just confirming that we don't have any pending questions in the etherpad. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I've taken this. So one question I've been trying to figure out is how to solve conflict within smaller communities. I've not had it to deal with yet, but conflict resolution support would definitely make sense. I think this is more of a comment. That was a comment from me. Okay. Sure. Yes. Um. Thank you, Paz. We are over time, seven minutes. I think we don't have any other question and thank you everyone for joining. It was really an interesting conversation and thank you Nima, thank you Yo, and thank you Jama. Uh, it was really uh, a wonderful to have all input from everyone. Um, thank you very much and I think that's the end of this call. So I will stop the recording.